we'll get started while our speaker is gearing up. Welcome everyone to the Northwest Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Center Jerry Health Series for Winter 2020. This is the fourth of these, and I welcome you all remotely. Uh, as those of you know from your previous participation, you the next slide. Uh, the Jerry, the mission of the Jerry, uh, the Jerry Workforce Enhancement Center, or the GWEC, as we refer to it, is really to ultimately optimize primary care of older adults. And we're doing that by engaging families, caregivers in age and dementia-friendly health systems, primary care providers, and a variety of other people, including the patients and um, their support structures. The objectives are to transform clinical practice by integrating age-friendly health systems that practice what are called the four M's. And the four M's are illustrated on the next slide. Uh, that is the idea of what matters to the patient. And beyond that, issues of medication, issues of mentation or cognitive function, and issues of mobility. These are key points in the practice of good geriatric medicine and related health arts. Uh, the next slide just gives you the uh, the rest of the programs. We're fourth in, and you'll see the titles for the uh, next of the six of the 10 series. Next slide uh, just gives you a little bit of background, the logistics. I am actually Michael Vidiello, and I am the Northwest GWAC co-director, sitting in for Barb Cochran, who is somewhere at a meeting, but not here in Seattle. Uh, I'll be monitoring the Zoom chat room, and I'll ask you to hold your uh, questions until the end. You can start typing them in towards the end of the lecture, and I'll be reading them out to our speaker. Uh, somebody says we don't have sound, but that's probably a problem at your end. You may want to check your microphones. Um, we'll add it here, but usually problems with sound are at uh, the other end. Um, for those of you who are partic participants, we're asking you one time to complete the profile form. The profile form allows us to bean count, to tell our funders who you are and how we're delivering to you and what you think about this, these materials. And then the weekly attendance form. The attendance form is particularly important uh, if you want to get continuing education credit. And then, of course, finally, an evaluation form about each lecture that you attend so that we can provide feedback to the speakers who are generous enough to come here and present. So the last slide I have just uh, lets you know that uh, there are continuing education contact hours. They're both through the UW CNE office, but also through the American Academy of Family Physicians. And we'll be posting these presentations within 48 hours on our website, which is northwestgwec.org. Uh, so uh, they are available ad lib whenever you'd like them. So uh, that's all the logistics. And now we can finally get to the presentation. Let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, she is Dr. Marissa A. Black. She's a clinical instructor in the University of Washington Division of Geriatric, Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine. Dr. Black completed her internal medicine residency and geriatrics fellowship at the UW and at the Veterans Hospital here in the Puget Sound area. She then completed a research fellowship within the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center, or GREC, within the VA and most recently published work on nutrition, education, and teaching kitchens in the American Journal of Public Health and the Journal of Nutrition, Education, and Behavior. Uh, it's a delight to have Dr. Black here to share her expertise with you today. Hi. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, excited to be with you today. Um, I am currently working as a clinical dairy professional, so this is a break from science for me. Um, and I'm here to talk to you. Oh. I'm here to talk to you today about, um, start again? Yeah, okay. Oh my goodness. Well, hello, my name is Marissa Black um, and I'm a clinical geriatrician at Evergreen Health in Kirkland. Um, and I'm excited to be here today to take a break from clinic and talk to you about um, one of my interests and passions, which is uh, nutrition and most importantly, food. I have no disclosures. 
So um, this is a general overview and outline of what I'm going to talk to you about. So we'll talk just about nutrition in the context of the four M's and healthy aging, and then a framework and overview of dietary and nutrient needs in older adults, um, going through sort of body composition changes and physiologic, psychologic, and social factors that all weigh in and um, then talk briefly about energy requirements, macronutrients and micronutrients of importance. Um, and then we will talk briefly about a dietary assessment and some dietary recommendations that support healthy aging and then talk about food insecurity in older adults. This is really the 10,000 foot overview, but it's um, meant to kind of cover the broad um, needs that we address on a daily basis. So um, the 4M framework. So this really sets the stage for geriatrics as a discipline that focuses on quality of life and function. Um, traditionally, um, geriatrics has focused on 65 and older, but now with increasing um, morbidity and frailty and the burden of chronic diseases in, in younger and younger adults, um, that um, focus is changing to kind of affect and prevent the, the burden of chronic disease. So the WHO defines healthy aging as complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, being able to do the things we value as long as possible. And I would argue that nutrition plays a big role in that, and food plays a big role in that. So why is healthy nutrition important for aging? So it's been shown to prevent disease and disability, maintain mental and physical function and quality of life. And it plays a major role um, in the management of chronic conditions as they come up in immunity and healing. Um, optimal nutrition can improve health outcomes. And I would argue improve quality of life and maintain um, older individuals' independence. So factors influencing nutrition in older adults, there are many. It is complex. As we age and the aging process, age obviously plays a role. Gender plays a role. Genetics plays a role. And there are many individual factors that affect um, what we eat and the nutrition that we pull from food. Um, and then there are environmental and external factors. Um, and we're going to touch on these as we go through the lecture. So first, we're going to talk about body composition, um, then physiology, psychology, social factors, and then um, energy requirements, macronutrient needs, micronutrient requirements, and fluid needs. So this is a little bit of a framework. So again, 10,000 foot overview. So fat mass generally increases until age 65. Um, <sighs> or 70, um, and weight peaks around age 50, and then there's about a 15% decline in muscle mass between the third and um, eighth decade. Um, and fat mass generally, um, so as fat mass increases, body water content, bone mass, and lean mass decrease. Um, the well-standardized nutrient requirements differ. So we, um, the Academy um, um, and IOM, the Institute of Medicine, comes, has come up with these standardized nutrient requirements. And they're, um, some of them match for older adults, but there are a few differences. Physiologic changes that occur. So food consumption requires vision, um, smell, taste, the ability to chew, swallow, digest, and all these systems must be assessed when we're um, evaluating patients. And the rates of visual and smell impairment affect up to half of older adults, and um, the rates of poor oral health may affect up to two-thirds of, um, of older adults. And this can be um, dry mouth, um, loss of dentition, um, and poor fitting dentures. Organ function also changes, as does metabolism and appetite. Um, appetite declines at variable rates, but all of this affects our um, assessment and our intervention. And then, of course, we have to think about the complex health 
profiles of the individuals that we're evaluating and the multiple chronic conditions that affect um, their health status, as well as the many medications that these older adults are on, which um, are often associated, especially polypharmacy, is associated with reduced intake of um, fiber, fat soluble, and B, B, B vitamins and um, minerals, and increased intake of cholesterol, glucose, and sodium. So the stuff that we would like to avoid. Um, many medications interfere with nutrition, um, and um, it is important to take that into account when we're evaluating patients. For example, metformin and B12 absorption, methotrexate and folic acid, um, L-DOPA and B6, there, there are um, many things that can be evaluated and considered when we're um, looking at a med list. Um, mobility and functional capacity. So acquiring food and cooking and shopping and preparation requires a high amount of executive function, dexterity and mobility. And that is something that we need to take into account as we um, evaluate a patient. And then the psychologic and social factors matter as well. So the context of eating matters. Um, loneliness, isolation, poverty, housing changes or challenges, um, the death of a partner, all of these things affect how and what we eat. Um, and then taking into account cultural beliefs, um, income and education matter when we're asking about diet and uh, dietary history. So when we're doing meal planning, um, how much energy should uh, an older adult consume? So an active adult, moderately active adult, um, the, the, well, so as I said, lean body mass decreases and um, people become physically less active as they age, just as a general rule. And because of that, their total and resting energy requirements decrease at about 100 to 150 kilocals per day, per decade. Um, and the decline in energy is, you know, multifactorial, but again, it's mostly attributable to less physical activity. Um, and then that subsequent loss of lean body mass. So, um, you know, 2000 calories is about a good bulk park for a, an individual who's five, seven and moderately active. Um, Intake in general declines with advancing age. So calories decline about um, per decade, about 10 kilocals per man, um, per men and seven kilocals per women starting at age 19. So the average intake is, um, you know, and the average intake is about 2,000 calories for women over the age of 51 and 2,400 calories for men. Unfortunately, that's not intake that's necessarily nutrient rich. Um, and um, a, a study from the USDA in 2016 showed that um, the average diet for older adults is low in whole grains, greens, beans, and dairy, things that we would like to see higher amounts of. Um, and, um, you know, that, that is a problem. So that is another reason for the fat ma mass increase. People are consuming um, more calories and becoming less active, so they're gaining weight. Um, so macronutrients, what is the optimal energy source? So I would argue that you know, we often, and I will explain later in the presentation, recommend the Mediterranean diet as a go-to. Most of the research has been done on that, but a broad range of carbohydrate, protein, and fat ratios can achieve good health and low chronic disease. And so the main thing I think, and a big take home point is to focus on nutrient quality and avoid um, processed food. So for macronutrients, um, fat and fatty acids. So fat builds cells, transports vitamins. It's a, it's a great calorie source. And the Food and Nutrition Board recommends a balanced diet is about 20 to 35% of energy from fat. High in monosaturated fat and polyunsaturated fats, limited in, in saturated fat and no trans fats. Um, and um, 
fatty acids getting about five to 10% of linoleic acid and alpha linoleic acid. Um, and those can be found in things like nuts and seeds and um, vegetable oils and fish and avocados. Um, so there is actually mortality benefit <laughs> um, in avoiding trans fat and saturated fat um, and um, limiting red meat and dairy and eating omega-3 fatty acids daily. Um, and so it's as simple as using liquid vegetable oils instead of butter um, and emphasizing nuts and um, sardines and that sort of thing. <laughs> um, carbohydrates and fiber. So quality and source of carbohydrates and fiber is impor important as well. Uh, carbohydrates basically provide 50% of the world's energy. So most people get at least half their calories from carbs. Um, since the industrial or turn of the century, the last century, so the end of the 1800s, um, when the, the um, grain mill was invented, um, we have stripped wheat and whole grains of their nutritional benefits. And so the bran and the germ are stripped away, and that's where we get our white flour. Um, it tastes good. <laughs> but it's not as nutritious. And so um, it is important to emphasize whole grains, okay? Um, fiber is also extremely important. Um, and the minimum fiber recommendation, I would say, is 14 grams per 1,000 calories. And um, there are benefits, there are health benefits, um, including reduced all-cause mortality, coronary artery disease, diabetes, colorectal cancer, in eating more fiber. Um, and it's not as hard as people may think, but it does involve eating more legumes and beans and whole grains and fruit and vegetables. Um, the benefits include improved gastric motility, improved glycemic control, reduction in cholesterol, and um, there's also higher nutrient composition in fiber-rich foods, and it leads to increased satiety. So when you're increasing fiber-rich foods, it's important to also assess fluid requirements because if you eat a lot of fiber, you bulk your stool, and you can become constipated if you're not drinking enough water. So making sure to assess for enough water, which is its own challenge, especially in older adults, um, is very important. So what is recommended is not what people actually eat. As you can see, um, three times the amount of fruit, um, at least twice the amount of veggies, um, five times the amount of whole, whole, whole grains, and um, over six times the amount of nuts and seeds. Protein. Protein is fairly controversial in the literature. Um, so the, the RDA, so the recommended daily allowance, um, is 0.8 grams per kilo per, per day. Um, and that's 10, 10 to 35% of the total cal caloric intake. Um, and that's in the average adult. Um, there are some studies that show that that's enough in a, an older adult and others that say that there's a higher requirement. So in general, people like to recommend one to 1.2 grams per kilo in um, an older adult. However, when people are sick and have increased metabolic demands, higher protein needs may be necessary um, and people have recommended up to two grams. Um, there is concern that um, up to a third of older adults may not quite reach the 0.8 gram per kilo per day, remembering that protein sources are often more expensive um, and harder to acquire and harder to cook. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind. Fluids. So this is a, a constant struggle for me <laughs> in clinic. Um, and so two to four liters per day of 
water or fluids, just generally non-alcoholic fluids, preferably non-caffeinated, but um, replacing sweetened beverages. I have a few patients that will only drink soda. Um, and um, replacing sweetened beverages, focusing on water, coffee, and tea is a nice message. Um, people who have cognitive impairment um, tend to forget to drink because they have lower thirst um, um, as they age. Um, and so one way to recommend that is to have a pitcher out and make sure you drink it by the end of the day. Um, or um, take when you take your medicine, have a glass of water. Um, or between meals, before exercise, sips um, and bites um, as you're watching TV or whatever it is. Um, and then the salt that we eat in our diets is quite alarmingly <laughs> high. Um, so we actually consume about 5.6 grams per day. The recommended is closer to 1.5 grams per day. Um, and most of that salt comes in processed food. And so this is a hard thing for patients to wrap their mind around because they often say, I don't add anything at the table. I don't add salt when I cook. Um, but it's in the packaged, prepackaged meals that so many people eat. Um, and um, a main way to avoid that is to cook at home um, and to discover uh, reduced or no so sodium alternatives. So potassium salt substitutes might actually be potentially beneficial because high potassium diets tend to portend better health outcomes. So um, if the patient is not in renal failure, it is a reasonable thing to recommend a potassium salt supplement. Um, and um, just cutting back on processed foods is the main message. So micronutrients. So older adults have lower energy requirements, but their vitamin and mineral needs remain the same or increase. And so it is actually imperative that they have a diet rich in vitamin and minerals um, to maintain function and preferably one that does not exceed energy requirements. So they're gaining massive amounts of weight and becoming you know, sedentary and, um, and also diabetic. Um, so micronutrients in older adults. So how can we get these micronutrients to people? So in general, food is the safest way. <laughs> um, surprise. And um, vitamin and mineral supplementation should only be suggested with poor dietary intake. So um, less than 1,000 or 1,200 calories a day, um, or when a diet is known to be deficient. Nutrient absorption changes as we age, um, and how it's absorbed it, it depends on how we cook our food. Um, so water-soluble vitamins, such as B and C, are better absorbed raw, and they're absorbed in the small intestine. So fat so and fat-soluble vitamins are better absorbed cooked with dietary fat. Um, and so knowing what parts of an intestine your patient has is important, <laughs> and um, knowing what they're eating and how they're cooking it also matters. I'm just going to talk briefly about the vitamins that we tend to supplement um, because um, I thought it would be nice to touch on those. So vitamin D, we tend to supplement. We live at a high latitude here in Seattle, so um, it's difficult to obtain the amount of vitamin D that we need. If people have darker pigment in skin, it's even harder, um, and it's hard to obtain from food alone. We need the sunlight. Um, so generally, I just recommend 1,000 IU per day. The recommended daily requirement is 800 um, IU in those 71 or older and less in um, age 51 to 70, 600 IU. But 1,000 is a good way to go. It's hard to overdose on vitamin D. Um, calcium. So calcium is best obtained through food. 
Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, one of which is it can constipate. Um, and the best source is usually dairy, but it can also be obtained from cabbage, kale, broccoli, beans, fortified foods, beverages, um, females, um, and males. Generally, 1,200 milligrams per day is good. So supplementing 100 milligrams per day is what we tend to recommend. Vitamin B12, so about 10 to 30% of older adults may malabsorb um, vitamin B12. Um, and so um, it's often found to be low and we tend to use a lower range in older adults um, and we often supplement as well. Um, it can prevent, supplementation can prevent macrocytic anemia, can, be, can prevent neuropathy and cog, neurocognitive impairment. Um, it can be obtained in the diet, but again, it's harder in older adults and it's found in cereals, meat, fish, poultry. Folic acid. Um, so folic acid is generally one that we supplement in people who are not eating enough food or have alcohol use or abuse. Um, and um, it can, it's found in cereal grains. It's a lot of fortified foods, um, ready, ready to eat cereals have um, supplemented folic acid in it. Um, and dark leafy vegetables, enriched whole grains. Um, and this helps with cognitive function. Potassium, um, people who are on diuretics, um, people um, who, again, are not eating enough um, vegetables, fruit, dairy, may have low potassium or just not eating, um, sometimes need potassium supplementation. So why do people take supplements? This is just such an interesting thought to me because I look at medicine lists all day long. And to me, a supplement is a pill and a medicine. And um, sometimes people are taking 30 or 40 and it's a $30 billion industry. So um, I think it's important to recognize that and that they can interact with medications. Um, but people take these supplements to stay well and maintain their health and wellness, fill nutrient gaps in their diet, um, and try and prevent disease and reduce stress and increase their energy. They take them to feel good. So should you recommend them? The National Institute of Health um, basically says there's insufficient evidence to recommend either for or against a multivitamin to prevent chronic disease. A few studies of vitamin and mi mineral supplements demonstrate beneficial effects. Sorry, it really should say few studies <laughs> um, for the prevention of deficiencies or chronic disease. So the main take home here is eating the recommended amount of fruit and vegetables and grains, again, is the healthiest way to ensure adequate nutrition. So what's our role as clinicians? Um, so partnering with our patients to promote the physical health and emotional well-being by using motivational interviewing um, is a good way to, to um, start. And performing our nutritional assessment um, that incorporates all of those factors that I included on the first, one of the first slides, provide education and counseling and resources. So I'm gonna give you a few tips and pointers for those. So when we do our nutrition assessment, one way to think about it is ABCD. So thinking about anthropomorph anthropometrics, so BMI, um, weight trajectory, usual body weight, and unintended, unintended weight loss are all considerations. Um, basic labs, clinical, getting a good history and physical exam, and then obtaining a dietary history. So BMI is really the most practical and universal measurement for assessing weight, but it doesn't really affect the composition changes, body composition changes that we talked about earlier. Um, such as increase in fat mass, decrease in lean body mass, and um, height loss. Um, and normal BMI parameters are actually, they should be higher in older adults. Um, increased fat mass, increased BMI has been shown to be protective 
Um, it's called the obesity paradox, um, but it has been shown to be protective. So a BMI between the 23 and 30 is what we should consider normal. Um, and when assessing for body composition, it's really important to ask people, you know, what was a good weight for you? Um, what, and then think about what percentage are they of their ideal body weight? Um, have they unintended, um, had, have they lost weight on an, in an unintended fashion? Um, and what's really been their trajectory over time? Base, basic biochemical studies. So many of the labs that we get anyway can be used to assess for anemia, assess for um, kidney disease um, and iron deficiency, glucose intolerance um, and inflammation and vitamin D. But I, in terms of vitamin studies, I generally, when I'm assessing a patient for the first time, get a vitamin D and vitamin B12. I don't usually get an RBC folate unless I'm concerned that the person isn't eating or may have cognitive impairment due to that, um, or they're not absorbing because they have um, alcohol use or abuse. Um, and then a lipid panel can help. Um, when you're taking a medical history, it's important to think about um, the history that may affect their um, their consumption of food and their absorption of food. Um, and then when you're doing the review of systems, asking about um, poorly fitting dentures, asking about ability to chew, asking about ability to swallow, taking a good surgical history, um, knowing if they have, um, you know, part of their intestine removed could be important for nutrient absorption, um, evaluating their medications um, and allergies, um, talking to them about their beliefs around nutrition, how they eat food, where they eat food, where they acquire their food, where do they shop, how do they get there, um, and assessing for whether they're able to afford food or feel like they can afford enough food is important. Um, a self-reported health is a good tactic um, for assessing kind of nu nutrient, uh, nutrition and well-being. And um, one way to ask in a quick medical interview is what is your usual intake over the course of a day? You can also do a 24-hour recall. All of these have all of these methods have their flaws, but um, um, they are quicker ways. You can also do food frequency questionnaires. Um, or ask your patient to do a food record for three days. Um, and then there are, we're not really speaking about malnutrition here, but you can do, if you're concerned for it, there are assessment tools like the mini nutritional assessment. So again, the clinical history should include usual and current weight. Um, you can look at the trajectory in the chart. Um, you can look at dietary intake. Um, and um, any gastrointestinal symptoms, it's really important to assess that on your review of systems. Um, and then the functional ability, how do they have a tremor? Do they have difficulty standing at the sink? Um, and disease and nutritional status. If people have diabetes or they're on a diuretic or um, they have peripheral neuropathy, all of these things affect how they're able to kind of feed themselves and to care for themselves. Um, and then thinking about metabolic demands of the different diseases that they might have. So are they hypermetabolic because they have Parkinson's disease or end-stage COPD? Um, and um, thinking about that when you're doing your exam, do they look cachectic? Do they have muscle wasting? What's their strength? Um, and are they, do they have edema? Do they have ascites? What are, what's the quality of their hair? Do they have rashes? Um, um, what are their nails like? Um, looking at their dentition, looking for um, ulcerations, looking at, watching them swallow um, can be helpful. 
Um, this is a nice chest checklist from the AAFP. So it kind of covers the four M's in its own way. So thinking about disease, thinking about eating poorly, tooth loss, mouth pain, economic hardship, reduced social context, contact, um, multiple medications, involuntary weight loss, needs, assist, um, needs assistance, meaning does the person need help with their ADLs or IADLs, or elder years, so over the age of 80. Um, Maybe that's a little ageist because some 80 year olds are just fine. <laughs> um, but um, there's actually some questionnaires that um, you can pull that are specific to each of um, these and can be done in clinic. Um, okay, so how do we counsel on healthy eating? So again, using motivational interviewing skills, reflective listening, asking permission, um, being sensitive to the person's culture um, and engaging with the patient um, it's a partnership, it's a collaboration. So making sure that they want to talk about what they're eating um, and making sure that they, they think it's important. Um, and I often use these, um, they can be used as a poster in your office. Um, the one on the, your right is um, the My Healthy Plate, which is from the USDA. So fruit, vegetables, grains, protein, dairy. Um, I like to tell them that the dairy should really be water, which you can see the Harvard has a healthy plate that has um, water. The um, Harvard has a great nutrition website um, and they have their own healthy plate. And then the middle one um, with all those beautiful fruits and vegetables and whole grains is the Canadian's, um, Canada's food, food guide. Um, and I think that's just a really nice picture of a healthy plate and it's a good um, place to, to start. Um, it doesn't particularly look like a meal, but it gives people an idea of what we're talking about. And then this, the My Plate for Older Adults is out of um, Tufts School of Nutrition. Um, and it kind of emphasizes all of those things. And I think those can be ordered in posters. So what about label reading? So labels are tiny. <laughs> They, um, the print can be hard to read for some older adults. Um, it's focusing on minutia and um, can make people anxious or distracted. For some people, it is the right thing and they should be looking at labels and it fits with their personality type and it's what they wanna do. Um, there are things that they're doing to kind of help with label reading, like making the calories bigger, having serving size in bold. Um, they've added added sugars. Um, so now, you, you know, it's not just the natural occurring sugar, so you can see if there's added sugars, um, which many people are trying to avoid. Um, but in general, I don't talk about label reading in my visits with patients. I think that it can be important for some patients, but it's not what I generally do in a clinic visit unless it's specifically focused on nutrition. And that's perhaps maybe more to what dietitians do. Um, the, I think the way to kind of help people with nutrition is talking about dietary patterns and it's the move. Um, and that's kind of a way to support healthy aging. And that's why people talk about the Mediterranean diet. Um, and so dietary patterns can um, be used to inform sort of dietary interventions in older adults and um, diets consistent with current guidelines are associated with superior health status and quality of life and survival um, and dietary recommendations based on foods and cohesive dietary patterns are easier to understand and adopt than the numeric nutrients outlined, um, outlined in a label. Um, and so, and they also may be culturally relevant. Eating is a social activity. It should be pleasurable and restrictive diets as a rule should try and be, you should try and avoid them in older adults. Um, so the Mediterranean diet. So I'm going to just briefly talk about a couple of diets that I think are worth recommending. Um, one is the Mediterranean diet. Um, and it's patterned after the dietary traditions and customs of people in the Mediterranean basin. Um, it has high intakes of components such as legumes, cereals, fruits, vegetables, fish, high ratio of monosaturated, monosaturated fat to saturated fat, and a lower intake of meat and meat products, um, lower intake of high fat milk and dairy products. 
Um, and there have been studies that have shown that it, that it is associated with lower cognitive decline, lower frailty risk, lower functional disability, and favorable lean body mass in older women. Um, so this is one of my go-tos. And this is a nice website, Old Ways. Um, they have pyramids that are culturally specific, and one of them is the Mediterranean diet pyramid. Um, the DASH dietary pattern is another one that is um, reasonable to recommend, particularly if someone has hypertension. It emphasizes plant-based foods and limits saturated and total fat, cholesterol, and sodium. Um, it has been shown to improve markers of cardiovascular health, including blood pressure, total cholesterol, and um, greater cognition in older adults. The MIND diet is a combo of the Mediterranean and DASH diets, and it specifies um, natural plant-based foods, limits animal source foods, um, and those that are high in saturated fat. And higher adherence is associated with decreased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline. So you have probably heard or read about these diets. They are not ones that I specifically recommend in clinic. Um, I think that if anyone is going to want to follow these, um, they should be seen by a dietitian. Um, because I think they're, they're hard to follow and, um, well, it really depends, but there may be some, some validity to them, but there more research needs to be done. So the longevity, I'm just gonna talk briefly about them because they're all the rage, right? So the longevity diet, um, it was developed to assist with weight loss, disease prevention, and extend lifespan. It's largely plant-based, low protein, um, at, that limits saturated fat and sugar, and it recommends a generous amount of olive oil and nuts and a multivitamin every three days. It advises two to three meals per day, depending on weight and age and confining all eating to a 12 hour period. Um, it is purported to be <laughs> purported clinically demonstrated beneficial effects on aging and disease um, risk factors. Um, the diet may be too low in protein for older adults, and the efficacy of fasting diets basically, I think, requires additional investigation. Um, intermittent fasting diet, so it is designed to activate similar biologic pathways as calorie restriction to extend lifespan and improve function in older adults. So individuals fast, so they have a calorie-free calorie beverages, add items so they can drink water, they can drink, you know, anything that's calorie free and they can eat typically unrest unrestricted for designated periods of time but those time periods vary um, weight loss changes in weight circumference um, uh, uh, waist circumference that shouldn't say weight circumference it should say waist circumference increased insulin sensitivity um, and improved cognition and physical functioning and health related quality of life have all been shown um, but the changes in body composition are not really delineated. It's unclear if the weight loss was due to muscle or fat. And really, when older adults lose weight, it's very hard for them not to lose muscle mass unless they're doing a lot of resistance exercise. And so weight loss generally is not recommended. Um, the efficacy of fasting diets requires more investigation. Okay. And then the ketogenic diet. So this... Um, is definitely all the rage or has been for the last few years. It's, it was established in 1920s as therapy for epilepsy and um, has potential therapeutic effects for neurodegenerative disorders, insulin resistance, and overweight, obese individuals. Um, it is very high fat and low carb diet. It reduces carbohydrates to less than 10% of the consumed energy, which as you know, we talked about already is not how most of the world eats. Um, and the restriction causes a shift from glucose metabolism towards metabolism of fatty acids, yielding ketone bodies as substrates for energy. Um, 
It's associated with improved cognition, cognitive performance in elderly adults with Alzheimer's disease. I think this is part of Suzanne Kraft's work. I don't know if any of you know. She was here for a while. I think she's at Wake Forest now. Um, prevention of cognitive decline for those at risk of dementia. Um, and individuals following the ketogenic diet may suffer hypoglycemic um, effects and dehydration. So I think it's very hard to follow this diet and um, do it well um, and eat low saturated fat, right? So I think that, that I mean, this is my opinion, but I, it, again, I don't normally recommend that unless I'm working with a dietitian and the patient's really um, set on it. So dietary patterns. So I think that they are the way to go. I think that they're easier to follow. I think they're more natural than being on a very strict regimen. And I think it's really important to eat or share meal time, not for everyone, but most people. Make it fun and delicious. Be mindful of eating habits and enjoy chocolate and sweets, right? Like we all love them and they're important too, just not in excess. Um, so diet is um, a key component of healthy aging. Uh, good geriatric assessment incorporates a dietary history and evaluation. Um, it is important to start the conversation with very simple educational tools and partner with your patient. Um, encourage real food, not supplements, is, is kind of, sometimes we use them and they're needed, but not usually. Um, and a healthy dietary pattern. And use your team. So this I have not emphasized yet, and I really think it's very important. So I believe I'm talking to mostly nurses right now, but um, you play an important role. The doctor plays an important role. The local dietitians play an important role. The social workers play an important role. It is um, just a group effort. And food is that, food is thy medicine. Hippocrates said that a long time ago. And, um, you know, everyone needs it every day. <laughs> so um, it's an important strategy to help people stay healthy. So food insecurity in older adults. Food insecurity is the lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy lifestyle. That's the definition from the USDA. Food security promotes health, okay? So in 2017, 50 million or 8% of adults um, 65 or older experienced food insecurity. By 2030, that is supposed to rise. That number is supposed to rise. People who have food insecurity are more likely to be in poor health. They're more likely to have multimorbidity and the multimorbidity and food insecurity are likely to have negative effects on each other. So for example, if someone has diabetes and they're on insulin and they have food insecurity, it is very difficult for them potentially to avoid hypoglycemia. And so thinking about, you know, how to prevent a hospitalization or an ER visit in someone who has diabetes and is on insulin is also about, it's also important to think about how are they getting their food? Where are they getting their food? What are they eating? Reducing food insecurity. So I recommend, and so many people are doing this across the country, it's great, but not enough screening patients for food insecurity. So, so programs are being scaled across the country. Um, a 2017 review identified 22 healthcare entities implementing screening. And I know King County is working on this um, and um, has a coalition working on it. And then we are responsible to then intervene. So educating peers, staff, leadership about connections between food insecurity and poor health is a step. And then working with community partners to try and eliminate it. And even in health systems like Kaiser, for example, that they have a fairly high rate of food insecurity and most of those adults are insured, right? So even in insured populations, there, this is a problem. Um, advocating for change, um, champ, champion um, implementation of screening and assistance at your facility, um, engage with the food policy councils that uh, um, locally, and add expert health professional perspectives to that. It's important policy discussion and all, all your perspectives are helpful. The Older Americans Act is important to know about. It was just um, um, 
reinstated this year or this past year. Um, and it was enacted in 1965 through Health and Human Services. Um, and it, in 1972, Title III C uh, funded national nutrition meals programs to reduce hunger and food insecurity and promote socialization, um, promote health and well being, and delay the onset of adverse health conditions. So people have been thinking about this for a while. Um, and almost half of the federal appropriations go to congregate and home delivered meals. So that's like Meals on Wheels um, and other senior nutrition programs. So just to talk briefly about Meals on Wheels. So there are 5,000 independently run programs across the US. Um, they're different in each place. So it's hard to kind of capture a description of each one, but um, they're each designed to meet nutritional and social needs of older adults and payment is donation based. Um, and additional services um, vary through different Meals on Meals programs, but exist um, to support quality of life and independence. There are even some Meals on Wheels programs that go and they do home repairs to prevent falls. So it, it really varies by program. Um, this was a pilot study out of Brown and the ARP Foundation that said, what is the effectiveness of home, or asked, what is the effectiveness of home delivered meals and the delivery method? And they did a randomized three arm uh, trial that looked at traditional daily meal delivery, um, where basically a volunteer or someone working for Meals on Wheels delivers the meal to the, the individual's house. Um, versus once weekly frozen meal delivery versus continuance on the waiting list, the, the Meals on Wheels waiting list. Um, and um, what they found was that there was strong evidence to suggest that home delivered meal programs have a positive impact on the nutrition well being of older homebound persons. So that actual like human contact and delivering the meal, there was benefit there. Um, notably, Meals on Wheels recipients. Um, are significantly more vulnerable than the average American their age and more likely to report uh, poor or fair self-rated health, um, not have enough money to buy food that they need, screen positive for depression and anxiety, report recent falls um, or that limit their ability to stay active and require assistance for shopping for groceries or preparing food and have health or safety hazards both inside and outside their homes. So over the study period, seniors received um, daily delivered meals. Um, the seniors that received these daily delivered meals showed an improvement in mental health, an improvement in self-rated health, reductions in the rate of falls, improvement in feelings of isolation and loneliness, and reductions in worrying about being able to remain at home. Um, Another program that is interesting and funded through the Ryan White um, initiative is um, the Food is Medicine Coalition. And um, I think they're, they serve about 50,000 people um, nationally. And um, this is basically a medically tailored meal for, um, for individuals who have um, multiple chronic diseases. Um, and they have a dietitian that's involved and it's often after hospital discharge. Um, and this is a preliminary study, but it showed that um, this medically tailored meal program might reduce inpatient admissions, which I thought was interesting, right? Um, and so there are lots of resources congregate meals, meal delivery, and then things like Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program. Um, and this helps low-income seniors with household incomes, not more than 185% the poverty um, income gui guideline. People often say fruit and vegetables are too expensive or I can't acquire them. And there, are, I guess my point of showing you these programs is there are ways around it and there are resources that exist in the community to help people kind of stay in their homes and eat healthy. Um, you just have to reach out to them. <laughs> and so here are some resources. Um, and here are further kind of places to get help for 
patient information or programs. Um, and basically, um, my message is discuss healthy eating with your patients through education, meal planning, and problem solving. Make sure you screen for food insecurity. Learn about your local food system. Um, connect your patients to these programs um, and to food pantries and congregate meals and farmers markets. Thank you, Marissa. Yeah. We've got um, a few questions online and if we may get a few from the home audience. So sure. uh, first question is, are sugar drinks such as Mio or Crystal Light options for adding fluid to a diet? Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with Mio, but Crystal Light I know is a calorie free beverage. And the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, so anything to flavor? Yeah, I think, um, what's the one? There's one that people are very into right now that has a lot of caffeine in it. So just be <laughs> careful. Ice, is it ice? I think ice yeah. has caffeine in it. Does it? No yeah. wonder I like it. So. What? Sorry. No wonder I like it. Yeah, there's a lot of B vitamins, <laughs> but there's also, I think, caffeine in it. And so I just think be cautious. You know, people have trouble with sleeping and they're drinking their ice late at night, you know, or whatever it is. Okay. Yes, but yes. I'm going to go back and check the label on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, what's the difference between the Atkins diet and the ketogenic diet? Is one considered better for older folks uh, that want to reduce carbs. You put one BMI for older people. This is the second question, so I'll come back to it. Okay, so the Atkins diet. So I would need to look at the specifics of the Atkins diet. It's not one that I um, ever recommend. So I, you know, I'm not a dietitian. <laughs> um, and so I would have to look it up um, in order to answer that question well. At the end of the day, I don't really recommend either of those. Um, and so um, you can email me <laughs> and we can discuss about that it further that way. Okay, do you wanna yeah. give people your email Yeah, right it's now? fine. Um, so my email, you can actually use my UW address and it's marissa, M-A-R-I-S-S-A-6 at uw.edu. There you go. And the second part of this question, you put one BMI for older people. Is there no difference between sexes as we age? Is this because of hormone changes, if yes? So the BMI reference for sexes as we age, I don't actually, you know, looking at the, I would have to look at the data for that, to answer that question further. But generally it's a blanket statement that we have kind of a higher threshold, you know, normal BMI in adults, we think of as um, 21 to 25, right? And obese is, or overweight is 25 to 30. Um, there's no um, uh, sex difference there. Um, and so 25, sorry, 23 to 30, just thinking about that range being a little bit higher for both men and women is fine. So I'm sorry I didn't answer the question about hormonal changes, but um, yes, you can just think of that range as the same for okay. older adults. We'll, we'll see, we'll take a couple from the audience here. And if you could repeat the question back because sure. they, they're not amped. Yeah, so I had a question about food insecurity mm -hmm. and the ability, are people open enough about it? It's, you know, it's a pretty, right. it can be pretty shameful. I think, um, if you could repeat so the question. people are, so the question was, um, people may be ashamed of um, the inability to afford food. So are people open about um, whether they have food insecurity or not? I think one way to do it is do a preclinic questionnaire on paper, just like, you know, sometimes we do the PHQ-9 for question screening ahead of time and not an upfront, you know, confrontation on yeah. um, And so that's one way to avoid that shame or put it in a long, you know, the, in a clinic intake, you're putting it in a bunch of questions. So it's a little bit more varied. Um, there, it's, it's, it can be as much as two questions. Mm -hmm. um, like, do you have trouble affording food at the end of the month? Um, that's one of them, you know? So it's, it's, I think people generally are honest about it when I have screened people, but when I have screened people, it was primarily in 
um, the veteran population. And I think, I think it, it's probably variable and I'm sure some people are ashamed because it is a basic need, but. But mobility, just to, uh, I mean, just, I mean, uh, mobility is also an issue with food insecurity. It might not be an economic one. Right. You know, so it's kind of. I think, right, so that's geriatric. So mobility, so she brought up the point um, that mobility is also an issue. And so, I mean, that's geriatrics, right? That as we lose our function, as we lose our ability to move and do these basic things, like toilet ourselves, that is, you know, that is hard for people. And um, so uncovering those things gently can be challenging, um, but um, being a detective and being a subtle detective <laughs> is important. Yeah. Other questions from our home audience? Yes, please. I just had a question. It's on the senior market, senior farmers market nutrition program where there's a map of the U.S. Yeah. I didn't. So why is or so what are the dark, the dark states versus the light colors? Yeah. So. Um, so, they have it in black and white. Yeah, so, so you have it in black and white. So state, state level, level senior, senior hunger in 2015 was the title of the graph. And the, so the furthest square or whatever shade the blue is for you is 0 to 4.9%. The, the Washington, that whatever color Washington is, is 5 to 9.9%. And the Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama is greater than 10%. Yeah, a lot of it coincides with the obesity belt. The exception is New York, which pops up Yeah, a lot uh, pretty of, high. It's interesting, a lot of New York is pretty rural. Yeah, the rural areas up mm -hmm. north. Okay, uh, a couple of other questions from the remote sites. How valid are the claims for juices to have fiber? Can juice be considered a source of fiber? Or only a uh, semi-liquid food? Yeah, so um, I think it depends how you juice. And I think that I just think people should, if they can chew and swallow real food, they shouldn't be juicing <laughs> quite as much. Because I think that some process of satiety is started in the mouth and chewing and with the timing, the hormonal timing that gets released in the body that is not the same when you're just swallowing liquid. And then in terms of the fiber content, I mean, that's going to depend. So processed food, what is processing? So if you take a potato and you put it in a blender, you are essentially processing that, which is taking away the body's processing of that, right? You're not blending it with your teeth. You're not chewing it. You're not, um, and I think there's, a, you know, you're taking away that natural process. So I think it's, it's if you, if food can be chewed and in, it enjoyed without being, um, you know, to the extreme of juicing every meal, um, I think that's important. So, and then how you juice, whether the fibers retained probably depends on how you juice and whether you actually obtain, retain the pulp and the skin and all of that. Okay. Um, Costco has, uh, I, I'm a, it's D3 at uh, 2000 IUs and B12 at 5000 uh, MCGs. What's the harm in taking these? Is there more than the recommendations you made? Okay, sorry. The D3, can you repeat? The D3 was 2,000 IUs. Yeah, so 2,000 is probably fine. 2,000 IUs per day is probably a fine recommendation. Um, and the it, B it will be hard to, to get over too much D mm -hmm. with that. And then the B12 was uh, 5,000 MCG. 5,000 or 500? It's, well, they typed 5,000. Okay, usually <laughs> it's 500 to 1,000 MCG. So that and sounds... Per day, which is fine. 5,000 seems like a lot to me. Okay. And B12, um, you know, you're building up stores. Um, and so... Yeah, there is a related question farther on down. Can you overdose on B12? That's a good question. A lot of people are supplemented and then retested and then they have very high levels. I, to my knowledge, it does not create harm. Okay. But I don't think 
that there need is a need to over supplement, <laughs> right? You're peeing out or you're storing your cash in other ways. Um, you know, that's part of the issue with this really big supplement industry. It's like, what is, what are you actually, what benefits are you actually receiving? Yeah. Um, that's the old joke about taking supplements is making expensive urine. Yeah. And, and it's, that's the real thing, I think. <laughs> um, interesting question. At what age do geriatrics stop building muscle mass? So it's a slowing process. Yeah. I feel like I'm being quizzed. I didn't study for my boards yesterday. Um, well, I think I know the answer. It sounds oh. like what you know. It sounds like what you said. I don't think you ever stop. So around, yeah, you don't. Well, around age thirty-ish, you or thirty-five, bone and muscle um, is becomes harder to build, right. and we start losing our ability to. Um, to build bone mass, for example, and it's just sort of the decline from there. Um, and so we are at our peak bone mass around age 35. Peak muscle mass, that is a question for Jose de Garcia. Did he already speak? No. Okay, I, I think he's next. And so peak muscle mass is, I, I would say it's probably in the third or fourth decade, but it might be earlier. And it becomes harder to build muscle and gain muscle as we age. The, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I know from my own experience, yeah. we've done uh, for resistance and fitness training in older adults in randomized trials. Uh -huh. And you never stop having the ability. Right, you can always It build. slows. Right, it's just harder. So back when we were starting these studies, which was heavy, heavy duty fitness training in 75 year olds, the common wisdom then was, you don't want to do that. Right. They'll die, they'll fall apart, they'll break. And of course, none of that was true. Right. And now right. we recognize that people at any age can train so long as they do it properly. Right. The other additional, to add to that, people who are the most frail often receive the most benefit mm -hmm. from doing resistance exercises. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's always beneficial to do that. Okay. So another, let's see, I've got two lists here. Uh, thoughts on boost and insure supplements? It's a good question. So I think sometimes it is easier for people to get their calories through boost and insure. Just similar to this, this is similar to the, the juicing kind of idea or the protein shake kind of idea. And if it can be used as a meal, as a supplement, like in addition to meals, because someone needs to gain weight, that's the ideal, right? But th there needs to really be an indication for it um, and a reason that it's being kind of prescribed. It shouldn't replace food unless the person is really having a hard time with food. Okay. This, and this will be an interesting one. Uh, can you talk about the nutrition impact of bariatric surgery and some general ideas of working with patients uh, that are preparing to have such surgery or have already had it? Yeah, so this is, that is a very specialized yeah. and nuanced field and it is not my field. Um, and typically these people are not in the geriatric population when they No, have but these it's procedures. starting. I oh, really? yes. Um, I mean you know, I think typically they are not doing bariatric surgery in people over the age of 65, but it mm -hmm. does happen. Mm. Um, and probably what's going to be more and more common is that we're seeing those people, you know, 15 or 20 years after surgery and they may have complications <laughs> from the bariatric surgery, such as vitamin deficiencies. And so for them, supplementing is often essential um, and having a specialized diet is also, is also essential. And I think that it is imperative that when people are at these bariatric surgery centers, they have kind of comprehensive care where they're being seen by a dietitian and followed over time and not being lost to follow up because people tend to stray from, you know, the original dietary recommendations. 
Any other questions from the audience here? Sir, are there any uh, general recommendations for like the eye vitamin supplements? Yeah, for like Mac to prevent macular degeneration. Repeat, repeat question. Oh, sorry. Are there any general recommendations for the eye vitamin supplements? So like ADA, A-D-E-K vitamins, so fat soluble vitamins. So I don't tell people not to take it. If their ophthalmologist has told them to take it, I say definitely take it. Um, and it has been shown to help in some. I think there's mixed evidence for that. But I think, yes, it can be helpful. So I don't recommend against it. Okay. Uh, is there an upper limit for the amount of protein you recommend for adults that are obese or very overweight? So some people eat a lot of protein, like three gram per kilo, I, you know, a lot, or sorry, let's see, three gram, yeah, three gram per kilo um, per day. Um, and I don't think that there are problems with that unless they have kidney problems. Mm -hmm. um, that's basically the long and short of it. Okay. And uh, this may be our last question. Are there other models for Meals on Wheels uh, that would be workable in rural areas? I think some Meals on Wheels programs are in rural areas. Um, and so I don't know the specifics of how those programs work, but um, there, you, if you map out where Meals on Wheels programs are, they're all over the place. It's, it's awesome. Um, you know, and different food pantries have different models. Um, they're, they're all kinds of um, interesting programs. Okay. Any other last questions from the audience here? Well, I think we've exhausted our online, so I'm going to thank you very much, Dr. Black. Appreciate it. Yeah. And to our audience generally, we will see you next week. And uh, with the beers criteria, uh, and meanwhile, if you could fill out your vows, and uh, we will uh, adjourn. Thank you very much. <laughs>